you know, maybe for, for folks who are more, um, you know, logged on to, to learn more about technology, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it was like assembling that team and working with a team to develop the, uh, was it uh, RadioViz or NeuroViz was the name? NeuroViz, yeah. Yeah, NeuroViz. Um, it was a super cool experience. So this, I think this forum today that you've set up is about neurotechnology, right? Right? Uh, yeah, it's both innovation and neurotechnology. So kind of, you know, the mix of both. Cool. Uh, so, you know, neurotechnology is a really fascinating environment. You know, I kind of think of like the key things in that world as brain computer interface and neuromodulation mm -hmm. and you know, different ways to deploy other technologies like AI and AR, VR within the neurospace. Like, this is how I uh, look at an overall kind of gestalt of what neurotechnology is. Sure. And for me, you know, my venture was deploying this um, technology of mixed reality, which is just a terminology thing, right? There's augmented reality, there's virtual reality, mm -hmm. they say mixed reality, extended reality. These words have specific meanings, but I think mixed or extended realities is a very general way of describing this technology. And then augmented and virtual have different particular meanings. I won't get into all that. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to if you want me to, but I don't think that's probably the most useful way to answer this question. Um, but you know that process of building that team and, and, and doing that venture was, uh, was a really interesting one. And I think your question was to describe that a little bit more, right? Yeah, your experience. I know you, yeah. you mentioned meant, uh, assembling that interdisciplinary or uh, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional yeah. team. So that process. Yeah, once again, it goes back to being at an environment like Cornell in New York. Mm -hmm. I had just friends who had different skill sets than me. Um, sure. And some of them happened to be bioengineers and neurosurgeons from um, you know, Italy or South America or so forth. Sure. You know, don't underestimate the environment that you're in in New York and Cornell. Uh, it's just a very rich place to meet people and to think about new things. And I was in a space where I wasn't taking calls. So I had some mental and you know, emotional, physical energy to be able to think about other things and do other things at that particular period of my time. And I happened to come across some really cool people that were working on deploying AR for, um, for kind of cardiovascular um, precision in, in, in how they were doing some of the, uh, you know, the cats and stuff that they were doing. And uh, this person was a friend of mine from, um, the Polytechnical of Milan, a bioengineer, and she was kind of describing how she was using it there. I was like, you know what? There is a lot of ways that I can think about this being used in neurosurgery. And then I started looking into it and I was like, actually some people are, some people are working on this. And then I started thinking about my particular world of the time and what, how we could use it there. And that's kind of how the idea came about. Um, the, the initial spark of meeting the team was just having one person that I knew that was, a, that was doing her PhD in this uh, from Italy and was working at a lab in Cornell. Um, and then from there, it was just, you know, building the network out, you know, her, her mentor connected, connected us with other people. I happened to have some friends um, that I met at Cornell as well, who were neurosurgery residents in Rome. And, you know, we were just able to kind of broaden how we deploy the technology, tested it out initially, got feedback and uh, went through this iterative process by building out the team from there. So the spark of the idea was, uh, was seeing what was happening in the environment that I was doing my fellowship in, the luck was having met a person or two. And then the effort from there was, uh, you know, talking to people, building it out, and then um, understanding what's happening out in the market and how we could do something differently and better. Awesome. That's very, very cool to hear. Um, so I do see Dr. D'Amico is logged on. So um, maybe if you want to just leave us with some, you know, parting words of advice and, uh, you know, maybe if you if you don't mind telling us where your mind is now on uh, next steps of your career and how at least how you're you know framing that decision making um, at the the next sort of branch point maybe. Yeah, um, so I am definitely at a uh, transition phase in my career, having now just graduated from this program. Um, I am determining my next steps actively, looking uh, deciding between options. So I don't have a conclusion to share with you on that right now, but yeah. I'm very excited about what's next, and um, I think you know, having gone through this MBA, my, my worldview broadened in ways that I wasn't expecting. So that's kind of my very vague response to that. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have a more concrete one right now, because I, yeah, no I, I have to, I have to decide. <laughs> yeah, um, it's an exciting time of, for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, 
and Silicon Valley is a very exciting place uh, to be in uh, during this time. Yeah. So it's 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 been a, it's been a fun uh, process. Uh, in terms of takeaways, I think you know I have a couple of things that I wanted to share. Uh, one, you know, to be the things that I found really uh, helpful and meaningful, especially in this last few years of my uh, journey and uh, career life, is one, you know, it's important to have a curiosity about uh, trends in the market, whatever space you're interested in, whether it's neurotechnology, health tech, digital health, and have and help yourself build pattern recognition and understanding of those trends, and then eventually be able to predict what is to come. The second thing is, you know, um, keep an eye on industry. You know, I think the, the clinical life and the research life is so enriching and so internally rewarding, but always keep an eye open to industry and, and understand what's happening outside of, outside of your lab, outside the hospital, uh, because it really drives a lot of what's happening in the lab and in the hospital. Uh, so don't, you know, uh, block yourself off to that. Yeah. I think along those lines, it's, it's been very helpful and, and enriching to seek out roles outside the hospital, you know, reach out to companies. If you find a company that's super interesting, that's within your uh, area of interest or some expertise, reach out to them, see if you can, you know, engage with them in some ways. Um, uh, and then be nimble when it comes to evaluating opportunities, you know, uh, but don't be capricious, but be nimble about looking at where the opportunities are. How can you use your skill sets and your knowledge in ways that are beyond what you're used to using them for. And I think the last and most important thing is to know your work um, and know how to advocate for it. And I think that we learn a lot of beautiful things in medicine, but I'm not sure that that's one of those things. So, you know, understand what your skill sets are, have self-knowledge and use that self-knowledge um, to understand what your worth is in the market and what you can do. And I think that can help you excel in, in, in whatever you choose to do and also, you know, help you um, advocate for yourself and in whatever processes that you decide to move forward with. So, yeah, those, those are my kind of things that I wanted okay. to be able to say to people, the nine people that are muted on this call. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks so much. This was, this was a lot of fun and I really appreciate you inviting me. Yes. Thank you so much. And again, it, you know, it's such a unique perspective to get, so we really appreciate it and uh, enjoy yeah. the, the rest of your weekend. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Hi, Dr. D'Amico. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We're excited can, to uh, to have you here. No, thanks for the invite. I can turn on my video now. It wouldn't let me a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. I just had to make you a co-host. Now you're uh, you're all set there. Excellent. So, uh, what is your guys' group? Who am I talking to today? Yeah. So this is uh, the Medical Student Neurosurgery Training Center. So we host um, kind of a, a diversity of uh, seminars um, covering you know really clinical topics in neurosurgery um, to more professional development uh, type topics like today. Where we we really want to get an idea of you know a neurosurgeon involved in the uh, the innovation and entrepreneurial kind of uh, process. Okay. Um, so primarily medical students. Uh, we do occasionally have uh, residents and uh, uh, other trainees from international um, locations as well. All right. Excellent. Well, I put together a talk because um, that's what I was asked to do, and it's a little bit broad. Sure. You know, I was I was told to talk about kind of innovations in neurotech. Um, and it's peppered with kind of stuff that's definitely not on my own, but kind of changed through neurosurgery. And then um, sure. some of the stuff that we're kind of working on. Um, that is and that I think is is awesome um, stuff. And I think it's uh, exciting. And so it seems like everyone's interested in neurosurgery. So it's not going to be hard to sway you guys that this is the coolest <laughs> shit out there, um, which is good. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and what's going, everyone can like, chat right we have a q a and like a chat yes yeah, so we have feature. the q a and the uh, and the chat function so definitely right. you know encourage people to use that all right yeah i love um i love when things are interactive it makes it more fun for me Absolutely. so i'm going to share my screen and see if this works can you guys see yep got it i'm going to presenter here do you guys get presenter view or do you guys see like the um, weird notes screen yeah so now we see the notes screen um, Hold on. i think you just have this switch yeah the... try that perfect better Yep. All right, great. We used to, I used to have an attending who used to go better, better <laughs> for everything. It's ingrained in my soul. Um, 
So anyway, so uh, yeah, so neurosurgery. So technically, it's not rocket science, um, and we're going to focus really on the tech. Um, and so you know, it's not rocket science. And then, so who am I? Um, and I think this is you know just in, uh, a little plug for me. I guess I guess a shameless promotion. But I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery. I'm an attending neurosurgeon at Lenox Hill Hospital, which is part of the Northwell system. Um, I focus on brain and spine uh, tumors. And so to, this year we're launching actually a center for brain and spine metastases, and I'm I'm directing that. Um, I'm all over social media, so feel free to uh, follow or, or send it to your friends and things like that. Um, and you know, I'm the I'm the junior guy here, and so since I've started, I've kind of um, you know kind of pushed some of the stuff that they have been doing to newer stuff. And the greatest thing about neurosurgery, and I hope you guys will get that from the chat, is that neurosurgery loves technology, right? Um, you know, it, it's just embraced it since the very beginning. And so we are always kind of at the forefront of, of kind of what can be done. Um, and we, we embrace it open arms, like fully, and it, it makes the field very, very fun. Um, who is Lennox Hill? You guys probably know Lennox Hill. Uh, there was this documentary on Netflix. Um, you can see my left arm in episode eight, but otherwise I'm a, I guess I have a face for radio or something and they wouldn't let me on it. Um, but there will be a season two. It's actually in post-production now. Um, the same familiar faces, John and Dave will be on it from a neurosurgery standpoint, and then a whole host of new characters. And um, they focus really more on emergencies, I think, than kind of what we had done in the last season, which I, I think the last season was pretty well done. But anyway, into the nitty gritty. So neurosurgery and tech, and I kind of alluded to this, we love technology, right? And a lot of people don't know this, but that picture on the left with that patient kind of recumbent, that's like the first CT scanner. All right. And before CT scans, we used x-rays and we used things called pneumoencephalograms, which we would do like a lumbar puncture and inject air and then flip you upside down in this table and let the air all go to your head and then move it all around. Um, but you can imagine the resolution was terrible, right? You had no idea what you were doing in order to do a, you know, a surgery for a brain tumor. Brain tumors would get, you know, very big before they cause symptoms. And then you would take the patient's symptoms and you would localize the lesion as a neurologist, you know, is trained to do. And then you would do this pneumoencephalogram and be like, well, I think there's something there. Um, and you would kind of go in blind, uh, which is insane. And so this machine was developed actually by EMI. Does it, I don't know if anyone knows what EMI is, but EMI um, was the record label uh, that put out the Beatles. Um, they were a music group, but a music and technology group. And um, they took their technology and they created a CT scanner. And that's the first CT scanner. You can see the resolution on that CT scan um, sucks, right? So again, you could see this right frontal lesion, but you know, if God forbid something was smaller or different, you know, you're not going to see that, right? And so we've come a long way since then, right? And so on the top right here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, but this is what CT scans look like now, right? And you can see the resolution is a lot better, but a CT scan is still just an X-ray, right? And so even though they've gotten better, you can do one millimeter thin cuts, and it gets very, very precise. MRI changes the game, right? And so MRI uses sound and echo off hydrogen atoms. And now we're able to get real resolution, right? We can see a lot of things. We can see very small things, right? So this here is all right frontal tumors. Every single scan here shows a right frontal tumor and you can see the difference. And frankly, if you're gonna operate on my brain, I want you to use an MRI, um, not a pneumoencephalogram and definitely not this old CT scan, right? So we've come a long way, all right? But we've we've kind of taken that and we said, well, you know what, actually this is fantastic, but Maybe it's not good enough, right? And so we developed neuronavigation, right? And neuronavigation is incredible. What neuronavigation does is you go into the operating room and we take your MRI, we put it in the computer, and we actually trace your surface, the surface of your skin, all right? And based on your position in space of certain bony landmarks, we can correlate it to the MRI or a CT scan, anything with you know high resolution. And then all of a sudden, we have a GPS system for your brain. So when we operate, we know exactly where we are with millimeter accuracy, all right? And these pictures on the right here, I'll, I'll get into talking about the stuff that this is showing, but you know, with, with advances in technology and, and computer modeling, things like that, um, we've been able to push MRI and therefore push our navigation techniques even further, right? So now we can not just see where the lesion is in your brain, but we can kind of see things like where the function is your brain, in your brain is. And not only that, how that function communicates to other parts of your brain, right? And we can use this on a daily basis. This is, I mean, neuronavigation is everyday neurosurgery, right? 
every single day. Um, I probably didn't preface it, but I'm going to focus mainly on cranial stuff, but we also have spinal navigation. Um, we can actually now, in the, really in the past probably 10 years, maybe a little more, we can do this same thing in the spine now. And we can use it to find the bony anatomy and nervous tissue, things like that. It's, it's a real game changer. Um, and you can imagine it also allows us to do less invasive surgery, right? Minimally invasive techniques now are possible because we can almost see through you. We know exactly where things are going to be, right? Um, and I kind of alluded to this, but we've, we've pushed the envelope here, right? So we've got things like tractography and functional MRI. So a functional MRI is you go in the machine and they have you perform certain tasks. And we can see things like in the image on the bottom there, you're talking and we can see where your language areas are. As you talk, oxygen, oxygen flow, really blood flow increases to the areas that are being utilized. And we can visualize that on an MRI. And so now we know that, you know, this patient, for instance, has a dominant left language area, right? And we can map it out with some, you know, degree of certainty that it's there. And we can avoid it when we go after this temporal lesion, right? And we can say, oh, this is in a safe spot. We're not going to hit major functional areas. And then with tractography, specifically diffusion tensor imaging, we're able to see the white matter tracks. And the white matter tracks are the telephone wires of the brain, right? This is how things communicate. And the technology here is even getting better. Right now, you have to kind of know what the functional tracks are and put your seeds down and then map it all out. But, you know, with, with updates in artificial intelligence, machine learning, this is becoming semi-automated to a degree. And now you can take those images and you can put them on your navigation system. And so in the operating room, again, you've got millimeter accuracy with your wand or your operative instruments. You know exactly where you are and you don't compromise these. Where you know any compromise of a functional area or if you cut a telephone wire, there's no more communication, right? You injure someone. So you know one of the central tenets of you know, medicine is obviously do no harm, but in neurosurgery, especially brain tumors, um, it's uh, you know, safe um, maximal resection. And that's because we know that if you injure someone, they do worse, all right? So in order to get someone to, to really optimize or maximize the benefit that they're gonna get from a surgery that you do, you need them to wake up good, all right? You need them to wake up without a deficit. And so knowing where all this stuff is becomes really critically important. And you know, guess what? We've, we've actually pushed the envelope on this. And so we get into connectomics, all right? And the brain is an incredibly complex organism, right? Organ in the, in the body. And, you know, there's areas of the brain that might be a little more quiet, but it turns out they all kind of communicate with each other, right? And so there's a new company called Omniscient, which we're working with here, um, that actually uses, uh, you know, MRIs from normal people, um, complex DTI uh, imaging, and it's able to not just pinpoint where the white matter tracks are, which you can see as these kind of ribbons, and not just kind of the functional areas, but it can put them together. And now it can say, well, these are connected via a network. Everything in green is connected via a network. And you can map that out in real time in the operating room with your navigation system, all right? Now, you know, there's limits to all these things, okay? Navigation can be skewed by things. There's something called brain shift, which is after you release some of the cerebral spinal fluid, the brain moves a little bit. And you become a little bit, you know, it becomes inaccurate, all right? And so, you know, we've, these are real problems. We have to think about them. And so we have, because that's what we do when we're, when we're bored. Um, and then on top of that, it's, well, how do you know you get all the tumor out? Or how do you know, what can help us with the tumor? This is telling us where the brain is, right? But how do we know where the tumor is? And this is important because not all tumors are, are grossly different looking than brains, right? This image is actually of something called a low-grade glioma, which I, I promise you, I don't know how many of you have been there, but in the operating room, this is very difficult to discriminate than the normal surrounding brain, right? But based on this connectomic image, you could take all this margin around here and be safe, you know? So you wanna know how to do that. Um, and so we developed things called fluorescence guidance, all right? And this is some of the coolest stuff. Um, I was, this top image is something called fluorescein, sodium fluorescein, which is about $15 a vial. It's been around since the 1940s. Uh, it was used in retinal surgery. And I brought this in originally when I was at Columbia. Um, and the way it works is it basically you give it an IV and it leaks through the blood brain barrier, which is disrupted in, in gliomas and certain malignancies. Um, and when you shine a light on it, it excites the uh, fluorescein, which is leached out into the tissue and it, it fluoresces and it fluoresces this bright green color. Um, and you can operate under this coloration. You identify your tumor and you can remove all this safely. 
The problem with fluorescein is it tends to bleed out in the surrounding tissue, especially as you operate because the edema, um, it disrupts the brain barrier and there's leaking and things like that. If you think about it, since it's extracellular, it kind of flows with normal kind of um, extracellular flow. And so out of Germany, they came up with this pink dye, which is called 5-ALA. 5-ALA um, is a, it's a proto drug, really. You give it, it's part of the heme biosynthesis pathway, which I don't know how familiar you guys are with, but it basically uh, makes protopore for nine, which is a fluorescent um, byproduct. And for some reason, gliomas, certain meningiomas, certain metastases retain this more so than other uh, cells in the body. The other cells clear it. And so here you shine a blue light on and you can see the tumor lights up this bright red color. And all of a sudden you, you now can say, all right, well, well, we know how to map the brain with our navigation. Um, now we can map the tumor. Right. And we can go through this and we can say, all right, now we're just taking a tumor. But you guys can see when you look at the surface of the brain with this tumor underneath it, these are the same pictures. It's not always easy, right, to find your boundary. Right. And so all of a sudden we have this intraoperative tool that allows us to, to you know, focus on this. And this stuff's um, pretty amazing. We've looked at this in, in large series at this point. And what we found is that it helps us increase the volume of resection, which we know. Uh, increases progression-free and overall survival in brain tumor patients, okay? Um, and that's been proven. It has an incredible positive predictive value, meaning that when it's red, it's tumor, all right? You can be almost, you know, sure of that. Um, the difficult part comes when it's not red, and that's the negative predictive value. It doesn't have a great not negative predictive value. And the reason for that is a, is a lot of things. Um, you know, tumor cells infiltrate. Um, I always give the analogy of, of a plate of spaghetti and meatballs, right? It's very easy to take out the meatballs, but if you had to get all the spaghetti sauce off, you're going to leave some. You're going to leave probably a lot, right? And that's how gliomas are in particular. And so just because it's not red doesn't necessarily mean there's not tumor. And we've kind of pushed the envelope here and not just talk about resection of a tumor now. We talk about something called a supramaximal resection, all right? And there's actually decent evidence now out of Miami that if you can achieve a supramaximal resection, meaning extending beyond the boundary of what you see on an MRI, you're actually gonna further increase someone's survival, someone's outcomes, okay? But you gotta do that safely, all right? And that's where our advances in imaging come into play, but also what I'm gonna talk about next, which is our advances in monitoring, all right? So now you're in the operating room, you can see your red tumor, all right? And you know there's functional tracks behind you, but you know, sometimes the red tumor blows right through these tracks. And so how do you know when to stop, right? And so you'd like some real-time feedback, right? And so neural monitoring isn't new. This has been used for a very long time, but we've really pushed the envelope on what we can do, right? And this is when we start talking about things like awake brain surgery, right? Because again, safe maximal resection. How do we do a surgery when we know someone's going to wake up okay? And these are kind of the principles here. On the, on the image all the way on the left of your screen, you see a giant tumor, right? And you see the cortical spinal tract for representation purposes, coursing right by it. The cortical spinal tract, as I'm sure you guys know, um, handles really uh, motor function, right? To the contralateral side of the body. And so in the past, right, you have a red tumor and you're either going to say, all right, I'm going to stop early and you leave this big rind of tumor, okay? You took out maybe, you know, maybe 60% of this tumor from a volume standpoint. But you preserve those tracks, but you left tumor, right? So let's let's push the envelope, right? We want to do better. Or what happens is you leave a nice little rind here, you get a good resection, but there's still there's still tumor here. Or more commonly, you follow all the red stuff and you blow right into that cortical spinal tract, and this patient wakes up hemiplegic, all right? You make someone hemiplegic, and it's not good for their survival. They're bed bound, basically, okay, or wheelchair bound. They get bed sores. It's a nightmare. And so instead, what we do is we electrify our instruments, or we have, um, we there's probes originally, but I'll talk about what we did here. And we're able to get close, and we can trust our instruments, and we can get within three to five millimeters of that tract. And now you're leaving the least possible amount of tumor while preserving someone's functional status. And that's that, like, perfect zone. That's where you get into that area where you're, like, really, you're really helping someone here, okay? Especially with a complicated tumor. And so... Um, traditionally, like I said, you would you would basically operate, 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 stop, put a probe down, stem, operate, 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 put a probe down, stem until you get close enough, right? And the general consensus here is about one milliamp of stimulation is about one millimeter. So no one really inches beyond the five millimeter mark, but you could push three in some tumors, okay? So within three millimeters, that's pretty good. That's basically like, you know, a couple layers of cells, basically. 
And then this is also where we talk about awake surgery, which I'm sure you guys have seen videos of and probably brought you, you know, a lot of interest into this field. Cause if you're like me, this is, this is incredible, right? So with awake surgery, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but in general, the way I do it is you go to sleep, but you're not intubated. All right. You give you, you get a sedative. Okay. And you do your work, you open the skull, you open the skin, you get down to where the tumor is, and then you wake the person up and they sit there and they talk to you and not only talk to you, but they move their arms, right? Whatever you need them to move, wherever you're, the area that you're worried about is where you have them, you know, do the task. And so you've all seen, you know, the real glamour is someone's playing a guitar because you have a musician, you want to make sure you can still play. Um, this is few and far between, I think, realistically. I think it's, it's you know, it's it's realistic for someone who's like a classical guitar player, maybe, but I think it's a, it's more for media sake than anything. But a tumor like this is super important. This is right in the motor strip, all right? And not only that, it's on the dominant hemisphere, right? 90% of people are right, are left-sided dominant for language. And so what you do here is you wake someone up and you have them talk to you and they perform certain tasks, tasks of repetition, tasks of visual naming, tasks of sentence completion. And you map out areas where when you stimulate, they stop talking, all right? And you preserve those areas, and then you're able to get an incredible resection like this, where you know you preserve that language area, right? And it's a combination of an antonic resection and also a functional resection. And look, the MRI is not going to look perfect, but again, if someone can't speak after a surgery, you've done them an extreme disservice, okay? Um, and so this this has become really you know cutting edge stuff. And so you take this with what I showed you last. And all of a sudden, you kind of get the innovations. And this is something that I'm, I'm uh, published a lot on now, and we have a big series coming out of it. But we take our actual instruments that we use to operate. This is actually my suction here. And we insulate it and we stimulate through it. And now when we get close to language areas, here's a dominant tumor right around what's called Broca's area. All right, We can stim through the suction as we operate. And let's say we're getting close, we get a stim at one, uh, one, you know, 10 milliamps, which is one centimeter, right? Then we can reduce that threshold and say, all right, drop it to five, and now we don't get any stim. And then we can push the envelope, we can reset further. And if we see a little blip, we know that we're close, right? And we can stop this at five millimeters, right? And this is precise. And rather than resect, 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 stop, get a stimulator, put it in there, we just resect until I get a beeping noise from my suction, basically, right? So this is you know, a real game changer. And then the other part of this is traditionally, um, you know, there's speech in two areas. There's something called a Broca's area and a Wernicke's area, right? And your Broca's area is more the ability to form speech, to coordinate your tongue, your lips, your larynx, all these things to make speech happen. Whereas Wernicke's is more the kind of like meaning behind speech, okay? And so what we're able to do now with a sleep you know, dynamic stimulation is we can actually stimulate the, the muscles of vocalization. And so in certain tumors, we can actually, we don't have to wake you up. Um, and with pretty good confidence, we can get close enough and keep you speaking when you wake up. All right, good, meaningful speech. We've started now using this in addition to the connectomics I showed you before. And now we, re we really have this incredible preoperative mapping. We can dictate our approach. We can avoid big areas of, you know, importance. We can use fluorescence to make sure we are we are seeing tumor. We know exactly where that tumor is. And then our instruments can tell us where our boundaries are, right? So we're able to give that safe maximal resection, um, which is critical, right? And so this is kind of really, I, I personally think anyway, the, the absolute cutting edge of kind of, you know, tumor identification, tumor resection, I think, especially for important areas. And the connectomics work tells us that pretty much everything's important, believe it or not. There's no, like, not important part of your brain. Um, but we can kind of decide, uh, you know, based on all this stuff and, and do a safer surgery, all right? And then I wanted to touch on things that are, are coming out that help us, you know, in addition. So this is something called Raman, uh, Raman spectroscopy, which is, um, you know, traditionally what we do is we take a tumor out, we send it to pathology and they do something called a frozen section analysis. Frozen section analysis takes about 20 minutes. They freeze your tissue, they run an H&E stain and they look at it under a microscope. And then the pathologist has to interpret it and send it back to you. And a lot of times it kind of dictates what you're going to do, right? If something's a lymphoma, you're not operating anymore because it's so responsive to treatment, all right? And it's invasive in normal brain. It's not a bulky tumor. So you just leave it. You stop your surgery. 
if it's a low grade glioma, you might just, you know, resect it inside and then decide not to do something. If it's a high grade glioma, you may go for a gross total, you may do a, a super marginal resection. Um, and not only that, sometimes with a low grade, as you get to those margins, you know, I should I should say low grade gliomas don't really fluoresce so well. So you really need your monitoring, you need your your connectomics, you need your navigation, you need everything. And I, I personally think you need this because as you get to that margin, if you're not sure if it's brain or tumor, you put it in this machine. And what this machine does is it uses a laser, a Raman you know, spectroscopy, and it's able to create a virtual H and E image. If anyone's ever seen an H and E image, it looks just like this. All right. This is created in two minutes in the operating room with you, all right? And not only that, advances in machine learning, they've looked at you know basically thousands of these images at this point from different tumor types. And it's not FDA approved yet, but it's coming. Um, we, trial, we trialed it here, we're bringing it in soon. And I was on the first uh, paper out of, uh, I think it was out of Michigan when it came out, the guy's now at, at NYU. But um, the computer will tell you, it'll say 90% meningioma. 80% GBM, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a ratio, it's a proportion, basically, it's telling you, I'm, I'm at 90% sure this is a GBM. So within two minutes, you get an accurate diagnosis in the operating room, rather than waiting 20 minutes outside, or 30 minutes, all right, or if there's something unclear, even longer. So, you know, this is another area where we've really pushed the envelope. Pathologists, I think, are a little bit scared of it, but it's okay. <laughs> um, and so, what's our goal, right? Our goal is to be able to get from here you know, a gnarly, you know, left frontal GBM in a guy with intact language and get him to here where we have a gross total resection of that tumor, his language is preserved and we've done him a service, right? Now, again, this is what's critical to understand is I'm showing you guys just like the toys I play with on a daily basis because I think that's fun. But the, um, the movement and the advancements in molecular uh, biology go, are going, are concurrent with this, right? And so when in the past we used to say, you know, GBM, right? Well, GBM is like saying that's a car, right? But we know that that's not just a car, you know, it's a, it's a Ferrari or it's a Toyota, it's a Ford, right? You can even go further and say, well, it's not just a Ford, it's a Ford Taurus, right? Or you could say, you know, it's a Chevy Camaro. Uh, it's a yellow Chevy Camaro. You can go into really, really granularity about all this stuff, a lot of granularity. And we've done the same thing in molecular biology. And so now this isn't just a GBM, right? This is a grade four, you know, glioblastoma with MGMT promoter methylation, TERP mutations, you know, IDH wild type. And every step along that way gives us information regarding prognostication, right? And so again, you know, neurosurgery in the past, you know, 100 years, it's a young field, now, you know, takes all this stuff together, right? And we're able to, you know, treat your tumor effectively, prognosticate you, and then moving forward, kind of dictate the best treatments for you, you know, and all those things are advancing too. Basically, every patient uh, becomes an isolated event, which is kind of incredible. It's very hard now to do these big general studies because every single person is a little bit different, right? And so we have to look at the, at the similarities between them to dictate treatment in the future. I'm going to show you a few other toys that we use here um, that I think are also just, just absolutely cutting edge. Um, you know, I talked about CT and MRI, but CTs and MRIs cost money, right? And MRI is like 1200 bucks. I forget how much CT is, but they cost money. Um, ultrasound is something extremely useful. We used it for, you know, hundred, hundred years plus. And, um, what, what we've developed now are these sonal lucid implants, right? So when we do your surgery, we take off your bone. Um, traditionally, when you put the bone back on, you have to get a CT or an MRI to see what you did. All right. Um, but nowadays, what we can do is we can actually drill a hole in the bone. We can put a clear plastic disc or a large hole in the bone. Uh, these can be 3D fitted to your actual defect. And we can put an ultrasound through here. And so now at the bedside, immediately after surgery, or let's say the patient comes out of surgery and they start deteriorating and you're not sure why and CT is busy and MRI takes, you know, 48 hours to get. You put walk right up to the person's head and you put an ultrasound probe on, you can see right into their brain and the ultrasound resolution has become absolutely incredible. And so now we've gone through preoperatively, intraoperatively, we're at the post-operative phase, right? And we've got, you know, technological advancements at every single stage of this, okay? So this was actually developed, um, this is a group called Longevity. And what they actually allow you to do is to actually not just make these clear plates, but you can implant things into them too. So there's something called an RNS device, which is used to treat epilepsy. You can implant that in here, right? 
Um, Neuralink is actually very interested in this. It was Elon Musk's company about, you know, brain, you know, it's a brain chip basically. Um, and so, you know, especially for stuff like brain computer interface, this is, you know, the, the world of implants are going to be very, very, it's the future, right? It's like a sci-fi movie, right? Everything is going to happen that we've all watched happen all the time. Uh, but it's very, very cool stuff. Other things. So we get, you know, post-operatively now we, we go through the rigorous molecular, you know, analysis and we know the characterization of your tumor. And we have to think about how we're going to treat it now, right? And I was alluding to this before as well, but we want to talk about pushing the envelope in treatment, right? And so in the past, it was chemotherapy. You got a port, you got chemotherapy, right? But chemotherapy doesn't work in the brain, all right? The brain has a blood-brain barrier and chemotherapies, chemotherapeutics are very large molecules and the blood-brain barrier says, absolutely not, you're not coming in here. Um, so how do we devise ways to get around that, to deliver chemotherapies? Well, number one, we figure out what kind of tumor we have, and we decide where, what, what's our target, right? Can we target a certain you know, gene mutation, or can we target an overproductive protein, things like that? And then we think about how do we get the drugs there? And so John Bookfar, who's my senior partner, he's a brain tumor surgeon, um, he's been pushing intra-arterial therapy for probably 15 years of his life, and he just opened up a phase three trial for uh, intra-arterial Vastin. And what this is, is the patient goes to the angio suite after their tumor is resected. We catheterize the arteries in their groin, and we send catheters all the way up to their brain, right? Looking on these little screens you see here, okay? We selectively inject blood vessels that are going directly to the area of the brain where the tumor was. And we use kind of, you know, drugs or pharmaceuticals to open the blood-brain barrier and then deliver chemotherapy directly into the tumor. And not just the tumor, but it's surrounding environment, right? And we know that glioma cells are invading, right? So all of a sudden we're treating not just the tumor, but we're treating that tumor environment, okay? And look, the drugs that we can use here are gonna vary based on what you have, but, and I think the last talk probably talked about this a little bit, we have to go through a process, right? We have to investigate, we have to take patients and we have to try things on them. We have to see who it works on and who it doesn't work on and then optimize, you know, and, and figure out exactly who we need to target, all right? And then um, other treatments we can do. So gamma tile is something I just brought in here. Um, it's, uh, it's something called brachytherapy. So traditionally, uh, what you would do is you would get your tumor out, you would go home and recover, and then about four to six weeks later, you would start treatment with radiation and chemotherapy, all right? But what if we could just uh, radiate you right then in the operating room and start treatment then, right? Because you know those four to six weeks, your tumor is growing. And let's say you have a very aggressive tumor, there's tumor cells circulating, they're, they're, they're changing, they're adapting, they're modifying, they're growing, they're replicating. So um, gamma tile uses cesium-131, which is a pretty, it's a radioactive material. It's in a seed embedded in a piece of duragen. Duragen is something we use regularly in neurosurgery to cover the dura. And now at the time of your resection, you line your resection cavity with this, these seeds and they're delivering very high dose radiation to a very short distance, okay? And now any residual cells around the margin that are that's in that field are getting treated from day zero, the minute you're done with that tumor resection, all right? Um, and the outcomes for this have been very, very reassuring. It's still not fully known yet what the best use is. Um, I personally use this in recurrent brain metastases. Um, I use it in patients who are gonna have a hard time making it to radiation. People don't realize this, but radiation for a glioblastoma is um, six weeks. It's five days a week for six weeks. You have to come to a hospital, get radiated, and go back home. Uh, that's a huge chunk of your life, right? And so all of a sudden here, you can lay this in the resection cavity and you go home and that's your radiation. You're done. That's it, right? It's a very big deal for you know some of our underrepresented populations who can't do this possibly, right? It's a big deal for the elderly who may not have enough resources to come in and out. Um, and truthfully, it's a big deal probably for everyone because you're also targeting these tumors um, when there's the least amount of tumor left, right? I tell patients all the time, um, uh, post-operatively, you have the least tumor in your body you're going to have right now, right? And so now is when we want to treat this, right? We don't want to wait for stuff to come back, repopulate, go into different areas. That, that doesn't make any sense. We want to treat you right now. Um, and unfortunately, surgery, you know, is the... Uh, um, it's like warfare, right? We're like in the in the stone ages with surgery. We we try to fix people with steel and string, right? A knife and some string. It's it's goofy. And so the the tech that neurosurgery has adopted, you know, pre, intra, post operatively, has really kind of pushed the envelope with all this stuff. And it allowed it allows us, even though we're just wielding sticks, 
um, to like still keep up with like the atomic age or biology or whatever you want to call it. You know, we're, we're it's like war. Um, but anyway, these things are, are pretty incredible. There's really good evidence now that it extends um, recurrence-free survival, minimal complications. It's very safe. And there's less of a burden on the patient. And so we really, I, I personally think this stuff is great. Um, and then, you know, kind of where we go from there is we talk about recovery, all right? And so we're not just helping people now, you know, with the surgical part of things, but now we want to get involved in the recovery because who knows these patients best? It's us, right? Who knows the brain best? Well, supposedly it's us, I don't know. And so um, one thing I'm particularly interested in, and this is sort of related to my work in the connectome stuff, is trans, uh, cranial magnetic stimulation. And so this creates basically an electrical field using magnets that is able to stimulate. It can either activate or inhibit neurons, all right? Um, and so what we can do is we can navigate this. We can use that same MRI navigation system, and we can pinpoint where exactly we want to hit with this, right? Uh, and right now, it's primarily used by psychiatrists for anxiety and depression, um, and it's effective. Uh, it's it's got a you know it's it's called it's a component of what's called interventional psychiatry. It's FDA approved, um, and patients when you stimulate the right area tell you that it's like getting out of a warm jacuzzi. They're really into it, all right, and it helps them feel better and, and whatnot. And so some people now have said, well, all right, let, well, what about if we stim areas that have been injured? All right, can we can we help recovery along? So that patient in the beginning where you're close to the, you know, a language area or the motor strip, or you hit a connection, a connectome problem, you know, a brain network where you now make someone, you know, a little bit less of who they were before. We talk, we talk about abulia, right? Abulia is a big deal in people. It's a, it's a motivation issue where they don't, they don't do the things they did before without really telling them they have to go do it. All right. That changes someone, especially high functioning people. And so um, one, uh, this is a randomized control trial I put here at the bottom. They, it's out of Germany, it just came out recently. They looked at brain tumor patients. This has never been done in brain tumor patients, really. People are interested in it, but it hasn't been done. And they looked at people who had surgery-related weakness of their arms. So this is a very accessible area. The, motors, the hand motor strip is probably like right here somewhere. Um, and what they did was they stimulated contralaterally while patient, right before patients did aggressive physical therapy. Um, and they had to stop it early, actually. The, the um, three-month follow-up, there was a st statistically significant recovery of function compared to like a sham group with this. And so the evidence isn't there yet. There's no level one evidence, but it's, it's very, very promising. And I think that, you know, being able to offer a recovery feature as well, you know, we'd be basically the only center doing this kind of thing, um, where you can do this in stroke patients, brain tumor patients, epilepsy patients, right? And we can bring them in and we can say, well, look, we did your surgery, you're on our chemotherapy, you're in our clinical trial, let's help you recover, all right? You know, that outcome wasn't as perfect as we wanted, let's help you recover faster, let's get, get you back functioning in a way that you're happy with, right? And again, these are kind of all the areas where we can kind of push the envelope in terms of what we can do. And I'm telling you, TMS right now is at the basement, all right? There is nothing but room to go in here. And then probably the part you guys are most interested in is things like training, right? So how do we train the next generation of neurosurgeons? Um, not just to understand all this. First of all, you guys are going to understand this inherently, right? This is just part of your life. It's part of your everyday life. Like, like your refrigerator probably has augmented reality and it and navigate. It probably tell you what food's in there and how low you are and things like that. But um, but we need to bring this into training. It's not just about reading a book, right? Cadaver labs are amazing. There's probably nothing better th than it. But we can you can't have a cadaver lab every day, right? It'd be it'd be weird. First of all, I think there'd be a lot of dead people or <laughs> things like that. But I think um, if you can model this the right way, or give you a way to interact with a model in a better way, all of a sudden you can do this. You know, in the morning when you wake up or at night, you can go through a surgery before you do the surgery, right? And so there are a number of augmented reality platforms. On the bottom here is one called Surgical Theater, which is out of Israel, which a lot of institutions use. And you can actually put in your MRI with your tumor. You can put in your DTI, your functional MRI, and you can make a 3D representation that you can navigate. You can drive through this thing. You can come all angles of the tumor. You can rotate it in space, right? And you can see where all these functional things are. You can rehearse your surgery. And um, you know, we published on this a little while ago that kind of reviewing uh, outcomes in these situations. And it turns out that if you rehearse something, you're better at it. Who knew, right? And so, uh, you, you know, people get faster at things, safer, better outcomes. Better outcomes are still mixed, but at least the rehearsing part seems to help with the actual performance of the task, right? But on top of this, you can take this and give it to the patient, right? And now your patient 
is a lot more informed. They know where their tumor is. They know what the, the critical things at play are, all right? The top image here is a group called Metavis, which we actually are bringing in here in the next few weeks. Metavis is a goggle-based augmented reality. And what it does is it actually takes your MRI, makes a 3D representation, and it just puts it in space in front of you. And so now, just like Minority Report, you can rotate this thing in space and you can see where the tumor is. And you can actually, um, coming soon, I don't think it's FDA approved yet, but coming soon, you can lock this on your patient. So now you can look at your patient in the operating room and you can see through their skin where the tumor is, right? You can see exactly where the functional networks are gonna be. And you can map your entire approach before you ever open the person's head, right? So not just that rehearsal, but actually your planning system. Um, and so this is 100% the future. You know, this is hopefully going to be a situation where you guys at home have your Oculus and someone's going to give a lecture and they're going to use a 3D model and everyone's going to be able to fly through this thing. Um, and I think that this is, you know, this in conjunction again with what's going on at all times with machine learning, artificial intelligence, things like this. This is the future of kind of how we do things. Okay. And then, um, you know, the last part I wanted to talk about was kind of pushing the patient experience, right? So we've talked, you know, more so than just than just the surgery and how well you do at surgery, but, you know, everyone's on social media, right? I gave you guys my, my stuff before, but like, this is an app called Playback Health. It was developed here at Lennox. So I, I, I use it regularly. And what it allows me to do is basically when you come see me as a patient, um, we have a meeting, right? But the data shows that people don't remember that meeting. They have no idea what you told them. They forget key parts of it. And so with this app, what I do is I go back to my office and just like this screen, I turn it on and I show you your films and I record a video of me going over your films, going over the operative plan, showing that 3D reconstruction, right? And then it gets sent to you, but it doesn't just get sent to you. It gets sent to whoever you designate. So if you designate your family member, your healthcare proxy, your mom, your dad, you know, your kids, um, your primary care doctor, your oncologist, right? Now everyone gets an explanation. Communication is key, right, with outcomes. It's it's absolutely key. It's also key for patients not suing their doctors, right? All of a sudden, they understand what they're going through. It's a documented proof here that, you know, you had this conversation. And so we're bringing this to the patients, right? This is now coming through, and this is only because of technology, right? This is only because of what we can do. And this becomes like a social media app, basically. And so, um, you know, I, and again, everything I've talked about was cranial-based, but uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. But you got to remember that the spine world is advancing just like this, right? And so navigation in spine is critical, right? Our, we just published a paper actually on something called um, D-wave monitoring, where in the past we did it one way, we just put it, we just changed kind of the paradigm. We're getting better results with it, um, more accurate results, less uh, kind of signal to noise ratio, or I, I guess improving the signal to noise ratio. Um, and so I think that, you know, people interested in neurosurgery in particular have to understand that, you know, the field is is just ripe with things to pull into it right, and advance tech. And just like the last speaker said, you, you do have to look outside of your wheelhouse a little bit. It's good to see what's advancing in the world elsewhere and then say, how do I bring this into what I do, right? Because tech is going to, you know, obviously Silicon Valley is going to advance a lot faster than than old, you know, neurosurgeons are. But, um, but at the same time, you know, it, that's kind of how to stay current and fresh. And, you know, you have to stay kind of, um, you have to push yourself because if you do something the same way every time, you're already doing it probably five years old, right? There's a new way happening. So you always want to be at the kind of forefront of this stuff. Um, and so I hope this is helpful. I hope it's kind of in line with what you guys were expecting or hoping. Uh, I really appreciate the invite. And I don't know if there's anyone left who wants to ask questions, but um, I'm also available. So. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.